So let's, okay, I'm going to switch to, I really wanted to cut tonight. Okay, so this is the last component of chapter six we're going to cover really getting into now electron configurations of elements and periodic variations of the element properties. And this is all going to lead back to the structure of the periodic table. So once we're done tonight, you should be able to use the periodic table to actually predict the electron configuration for a particular element or ion. Okay. So, remember that we said that the energy of, of atomic numbers increases as the principal quantum number increases. Okay. And as that principal quantum number increases, the size of the orbital is going to get bigger and the electrons are going to spend more in more time, the further away they are from the nucleus. So with a higher quantum number, the energy, the energy associated with the orbital is higher and that attraction to the nucleus is weaker because it's further away. Okay. So, in terms of electrons, in the first four principal quantum numbers, one, two, and three, four, this is the maximum number of electrons that each energy level can hold. Now you can think about this if you just think through the math. In the first energy level, there's only one orbital, an s orbital. And that s orbital can hold two electrons, just like any other orbital. Now, in the second energy level, what? How many orbitals are there? Or how many? I should say, how many different shapes are there in the second energy level? Two, correct. You have an S and a P. Now, remember I said earlier there's three that this the P orbital can point in one of three directions. So we can have a P orbital on the X axis, the Y axis, or the Z axis. So that means there's one S orbital and three different P orbitals. Now the P orbitals are still the same energy but the difference is they're pointing in different directions. So that gives us four orbitals. And each orbital can hold two electrons, so that means we, can, we have eight possible electrons that we can fit in that second energy level. Now for the third energy level, what are the, what are the orbitals we have? We have S, P, and there's one more, D. So there's one possible s or one orbital. With the p orbitals, there can be three possible magnetic properties for the p orbital. So it can be a p x y or p z. And with the d orbitals, there's five possible ways it can be oriented in space. So we have one s orbital three possible p orbitals, that's four, and then another five possible d orbitals. So altogether, that's nine orbitals in the third energy level. Each orbital can still hold two electrons, so nine times two is 18. So in the fourth energy level now, we have s, p, 
D, and F. So we have there's one set of S orbitals. There's three P orbitals. There's five D orbitals, and there's seven F orbitals. So we add them all up. One plus three is four. Okay. Four plus five is nine. And nine plus seven is 16. So there's 16 possible orbitals that can exist in that fourth energy level. And each one can hold two electrons. So that gives us 32 again. All right. So this is just showing it. It's a little more drawn out. Okay, here's N equals one. We have a single S orbital. In the second shell or second energy level, we have the S, our three P orbitals, Px, Py, and Pz. Each of these orbitals can hold two electrons. In the third energy level, we have S, P, and D. Let me grab the pointer so you can, that might help. S, P, and D. Notice there's five D orbitals here. So again, this is total of. 18, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 electrons that can be stored in this third energy level. And then the fourth energy level, we have 1s orbital, three different p orbitals, five different d orbitals, and seven different f orbitals. And each individual orbital can hold, again, two electrons. Okay. And again, I said this before, just looking at energy levels within a certain level, S is the lowest, P is a little greater, D is greater, and F is highest. Now, if you're comparing orbitals between principal energy levels, it gets a little more complicated because sometimes you can have a F or a D orbital in a lower sub in a lower shell that's lower energy than an s orbital in the higher shell so there's a little bit of overlapping when you're looking at combining energy levels between different um, principal quantum members okay so in this check i'm giving you three different principal quantum numbers and it's asking you to identify the sublevels. Now, a sub, when we say sublevel, you can also think a sublevel is also just a number of possible orbital shapes. Okay, orbital shape is a sublevel. So for A, how many sublevels are there when N is one? One, correct, it's just DS. When n is 4, how many sublevels are there? So there's two ways to think of this. We said that, um, we looked at that, um, the values of the magnetic spin quantum number start at zero and go to whatever n is minus one. So in, when n equals four, we could have our magnetic, I'm sorry, our angular momentum quantum number can either be zero, one, two, or three. How many possible numbers is that? Zero, one, two, three. Zero, one, two, three. How many different numbers did I say? Four. Right. Now, again, those values correspond to S, P, D, and F. So when N is four, there are four sublevels. There it's the, S, the P the D, and the F. We, when we talk about sublevels, okay, 
we're referring to all the orbitals of that shape within a layer. Okay, so but if I say the D, 3D sublevel example, I'm referring to all of these D orbitals. Okay, they're all equal energy. But so that's the 3D sublevel. If I say a 3D orbital, I'm referring to any one of these specific separate orbitals. But all the 3D sublevel refers to all of the 3D orbitals that exist in that third shell. So when n is 4, there's four possible sublevels because there's four possible orbital shapes, s, p, d, and f. So how about when n is 2? How many sublevels do we have? N is two, there's two sublevels. There's the SP. And again, if you're going back to the quantum numbers, S refer S is that is when the angular momentum number is zero. P is when the angular momentum number is one. Okay. So it's zero and one, but we just recall it S and P for instead you most of the time. Okay. And this is this is just referring to the specific sublevels by their name. Okay, so if I'm in the S sub one n equals one, I have one sublevel which is called one S. We re used one before the S to distinguish it between a two S or three S or a four S. So when n is four, there's again four different sublevels, four S, four P. 4d and 4f, and when n is 2, we have two sublevels 2s and 2p. Okay, so again, an orbital again is a three dimensional probability region. Okay, and they define it here as a three dimensional space where the electron has the highest probability of being found. And it just represents a probability density. It is not you can't think of it as a path or a defined region. It's a region where you're most likely to find it. They don't orbitals don't really have hard edges. They more like this diagram where they kind of just like a cloud. They kind of just gradually disappear into nothing less it doesn't have a specific defined boundary. Okay, because it's all based on probability. So again, each orbital has a specific shape and the shape refers to the shape. And so the letter refers to the shape. And the, the number in front of it refers to what energy level that specific shape is and the higher the energy level the greater the distance you are from the nucleus and likewise the greater the size of the orbital okay here's just another illustration of the p orbitals um, again they're kind of propeller shaped existing on x y and z axes and if they're all if we have an electron where they're all occupied, this is how the three p orbitals would be arranged relative to each other. Okay, but this is not a single orbital. This is three separate orbitals that they just superimpose them on each other. This is a p orbital, each one of these. But within the p sublevel, there's three possible p orbitals each pointing in a different direction okay so with that n equals 2 energy level we have, have two sublevels 2s 2p 
2s sublevel just contains one orbital, okay, the 2s. The 2p orbital contains three p orbitals, which are perpendicular to each other, px, py, pz. And each individual orbital holds two electrons. Okay. Third energy level contains three sublevels, 3s, p, 3p, and 3d. And again, the 3s just contains one orbital, just like the 2s and the 1s. The 3p contains three orbitals, just like the 2p did, px, py, and pz. And the 3d has five d orbitals. And we refer to them based upon the axes that they're either on or between. And this 3dz squared is a little different than the others because it just has a different appearance. But in terms of its energy, it's identical in energy. So you have to kind of think of it as just another identical orbital. Even though it looks different, mathematically, has equal energy of all the others. Okay, you can see what I mean here. So, well, these three d orbitals, these for the first four d orbitals, all look identical. They're just pointing different directions in space. This d orbital looks very different from the others. However, mathematically, it's identical in energy. So we just we it's, it looks like it's almost as if two of the lobes have been superimposed on each other, but in terms of its energy has equal energy, so equal probability of occurring. Um, so just think of it, even though it has a weird shape compared to the others, just think of it, it's still a d orbital. Okay. Now we jump up to the next level. F orbitals start in the n equals 4 level. So we have four sublevels or four shapes. We have the 4s, 4p, 4d, and 4f. Again, the 4s only has one s orbital. And the, the 4p, well, 4p sublevel contains three different p orbitals along with three different axes. The 4d contains four five d orbitals, just like we found them in the 3d sublevel. And the 4f contains seven f orbitals. And again, these have complex shapes. I showed them on the other slide. They don't usually, some books don't show them all because just because their shapes are so complicated and they don't really, unless you have a good um, graphics engine, it's not, a lot of the old textbooks never even bother to show the f orbitals. Okay. So here's a little different. They're either giving you, they're not always giving you a sublevel, they may give you just a principal quantum number, but it's asking to give the type and number of orbitals in each of the following energy levels of sublevels. So in the 4D sublevel, how many orbitals do we have? Five, correct. Okay, so if we go back. 5D, it doesn't matter if it's 3D, 4D, 5D, there's always going to be five possible orbitals within a D sublevel. So the type, and the type is the same as the sublevel, they're all 4D orbitals. When n equals 4, first, what are the types of orbitals we have here? Right. We have a 4s, we have a 4p, we have a 4d, and we have a 4f. So with the 4s, 
we only have one orbital. The 4p, we have three orbitals. With the 4d, we have five orbitals. And the 4f, we have seven orbitals. So the sum of those would be the total number of orbitals, which would be 18. And the 2p sublevel, how many orbitals do we have here? P is the propeller shaped one, just three, correct, on the x, y, and z axis. Okay. Any questions so far? So everyone understand the difference between a sublevel versus an orbital versus a shell or energy level. I don't see any questions, so let me go on. Okay. So usually when we talk about energy level, that's just another word for the principal quantum number. And the sublevel is referring to the number of possible shapes within that energy level. So in this case, with the 4D sublevel, we have five 4D orbitals. I think this all makes sense. Mention the Pauli exclusion principle again. That just says um, no no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. So um, as long as two electrons have opposite spins, you can put two electrons in an orbital. Okay. And usually when you're drawing electron diagrams, which you will show um, the different orbitals and usually we represent the different orbitals with box labeled boxes and when we put electrons in the orbitals we're going to represent the electrons with arrows and to represent their different spins whether it's north oriented or south oriented spins relative to the magnetic property of the uh, orbital itself Okay. So, when we talk about sublevels, the number of electrons in each sublevel is just equal to the number of orbitals in that sublevel times two. Okay, so an S sublevel can hold at most two electrons. Now, each P orbital can hold two electrons at most, but if there's three P orbitals, the entire P sublevel for any 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 p sublevel can hold at most six electrons. Doesn't mean it's necessarily going to have them all filled, but it can hold as most six electrons. D orbital has five. D sublevel has five d orbitals, so that can hold ten electrons, and an f has seven f orbitals, so that can hold fourteen electrons. Okay, and here's just a summary of that. Okay. So, again, any atom with two or more electrons, repulsion between the electrons makes energy of subshells with different values of L differ. Okay. So that means is when you have atoms with more than multi, more, many electrons, if you when you have when you have electrons with different L values, so that's the different shapes. They're going to have different energies. 
Okay. So hydrogen, it's a, just another way of saying that when you have multiple electrons in an atom, different um, shapes or sublevels are going to have different energies. So I showed this before. This is a generalized diagram for orbital sublevel energy levels starting from the lowest to highest. And the multiple lines just indicate um, all the different orbitals. And within a sublevel, all the orbitals are the same energy. So they're shown at the same height compared to the bottom of the graph. OK. Now, this all comes down to the rules that we're going to use when we write out an electron configuration. Now, electron configuration is going to describe how the electrons are arranged in the atom. And we describe it by saying what electrons are placed in what orbitals. So, a con configuration is going to contain three pieces of information. The principal quantum number, a letter that designates the orbital type, and a superscript that's going to indicate how many electrons are in that particular subshell. So here's an example for hydrogen. Hydrogen is simple. It's one electron. Well, it's going to be in the po lowest possible orbital, which is the 1s orbital. So we show we have an electron in the 1s orbital, so we put 1s. And because there's only one electron in here, we use this superscript to indicate how many electrons are in that particular sublevel. In this case, it's just one. So, anyone want to guess what helium would look like? We just, it's going to be similar to hydrogen, it just has one extra electron. So, what do you think the electron configuration of helium would look like? No guesses? That's correct. It's going to be a 1s2. Okay. We're going to put that next electron in the same sublevel because remember I said each orbital can hold up to two electrons. So in that 1s sublevel, there's a, a spot for another electron. So when for helium, it's going to be 1s2. Okay. So, off bar principle pretty much states that when you are configuring electron orbitals, you build from the bottom up. Okay. So, electrons are going to occupy the lowest available energy level. And we have to also have to remember the Pauli exclusion principle, which states that no more than two electrons occupy any one orbital. And when they do occupy the orbital, they would have opposite spins. So think of it like if you're stacking, uh, making a stack of books, okay? You have to, you have to put the book, you have to put the books on the bottom of the stack before you can put the books on the top of the stack. Okay, you can't build a stack of books the top going down. Well, same with putting electrons in orbitals. We start with the bottom levels and then we build up, build up from there. So this is an example of an off-bar diagram. I've also seen this um, 
with the one S at the bottom, but idea is the same, okay? We start with this chart where we just show the orbitals sublevels starting from 1s, then we have 1s, 2p, the next row is 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s, 4p, 4f, 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f. Technically, a 5g orbital exists, but there's no elements that actually use that, so we don't show it. 6p, 6d, 6s, 6p, 6d, and 7s, 7p. Then we show draw diagonal lines through this chart, like so. And then all you have to do is follow the arrows, and that will show you the order of the energy levels as you go from the lowest to the highest. So we start with 1s, and then we go to the next highest orbital is 2p, I'm sorry, 2s. And then the next level is 2p, 3, and then s, and then 3p, 4s, and then 3d, then 4p, then 5s. So it just shows the energy levels for the sublevels going from the lowest to the highest. It's really just showing you the same information that's in this chart. Okay. If I can't look at these elements going from the lowest to the highest, it follows the same pattern or the same order that the UI diagram goes. So, if you ever have to memorize it and you want to test, this is a little way of easy way to just jot it down. So, in case you uh, so make sure you get the order right, it's just a little quick little cheat sheet that you can jot down if you ever have to take a test and you don't have the the orbitals with you or orbital lists with you or you don't have a periodic table. You can use this to kind of predict the order. Okay. Now each the periodic table is actually organized based upon how the electrons fill up the uh, orbitals. And we can separate the periodic table into blocks. So if you see this, these first two columns and the helium is an S block. This yellow region is a D block, this region is a P block, and the two bottom rows is an F block. And if you follow the periodic table, that will actually take you through the orbital filling rules. Okay, we go from 1s, then to 2s, 2p, then we start the third row, we hit 3s, 3p. We start the fourth row, 4s. Then we go to 3d because 3d is the next higher energy than 4s. So by tracing the path of the periodic table, see how the blocks follow the order of the sublevel energy levels. Okay. So this periodic table is actually following this same order from lowest to highest energy level. Okay, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s. You get that same order on the periodic table. Okay, 1s. We start the second show, second row, 2s, 2p. We start the third row, 3s. Now the next level up from 3s is 3p. And then we start the fourth row, which is 4s. Now right after 4s is the 3d orbital, because the 3 is just slightly higher in energy than a 4s orbital. 
So we go, we fill the 3D orbitals, then we go back to 4P. And we have 5S, now we fill the 4D orbital, and we go back to 5D. And then look what happens when we hit row 6. We have 6S, there's a little gap here. So it's really, after you hit this spot, the next element starts down here. This is the F orbitals. So that's 4F. Once we reach the end of the 4F, we continue back up here, 5D, and then 6P. And then we go to 7, Roven 7S, 5F, 6D, and this is labeled, it should be 7P. Okay, so the periodic table also follows the orbital filling rules. And the, si the number, the size of these, the width of these block regions also models the orbitals as well. Okay, so remember we said for the s orbital, there's only one possible s orbital. It can hold two electrons, so that's why this is only two across, because you can only put two electrons in a particular s sub level before you go on to the next sub level. With the two p's, or in all the p's, there's three p orbitals, and each p orbital can hold two electrons. So three times two is six, and notice the p block is six across. Going on to our d block, there were five d orbitals. Each d orbital can again hold two electrons, and notice that this is ten across. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, because there's ten electrons we can fill up before the d orbital is filled up, and we have to go on to the next sublevel. And the same with the 4f, okay? 4f, there's seven f orbitals within a sublevel. Each orbital can hold two electrons, so that's four, seven times two is 14. This is 14 across, so two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. So the periodic table can also help you guide and and show you how to fill up the orbitals. And I, I always find it easy when I, have to, when I have to draw an electron orbital or write electron configuration. I think using the periodic table and, fall, and just labeling the blocks like this is much easier than using an off-bar diagram like this. It's the same information. Plus, the periodic table also gives you a hint about the number of electrons in each orbital if you look at the, uh, the widths of each blocked region. Okay. So, orbital diagrams are similar to just electron configurations. They just give you a little more information. So, with an orbital electron configuration, I just show the sublevels and the number of electrons within each sublevel. With an orbital diagram, I actually show the individual electrons. So it gives me a little more information because I'm not just showing how many electrons, I'm showing their spins as well. And so with the an orbital diagram, you're going to represent the electron with an upward or downward forming arrow, and they usually just show like a half arrow pointed up or down. So we were right when we guessed 1s2 for helium, okay? Two electrons in that 1s shell, so its electron configuration would be 1s2, and the orbital diagram would just be a single box labeled 1s and showing two electrons in it. Now, lithium would have three electrons. So I'm going to put 
two of those electrons in the once region, and then an, the last electron in this 2s region, because you see lithium here ends right at the beginning of the 2s block. So I've gone through the 1s orbital with those electrons. I've ended where lithium is by putting a single electron in a 2s block. So the configuration would be 1s2 and 2s1. Okay, the one is one electron in that 2s. So if the diagram would show a box labeled 1s with two electrons in it, and notice they have opposite spins because they're, point, they're pointing in opposite directions, and then 2s just has a single electron. For beryllium, which is the next element, let's go back to that periodic table. I put beryllium is right here, BE. So I go through the 1s, put the two electrons there, and I go through and complete the 2s sublevel. So I have two electrons in the 2s. And so my orbital diagram is going to show 1s2, 2s2. I should say this is the electron configuration. This is the orbital diagram. So I have two electrons in the 1s box and two electrons in a 2s box. Okay. So again, I'm gradually adding electrons to the orbitals as I build up the atom. And I fill them in order of increasing energy. Now, remember, an orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. However, there's a little... Now, what happens if I have multiple electrons within a sublevel? Should I put two electrons in the same orbital or spread them out? And the rule states that they're actually more stable when they're in separate orbitals. And it kind of makes sense. You think of electrons are negatively charged particles. So if you, haven't, if you have to put two electrons within the same sublevel, they probably want to be far away from each other because they have similar charges. So what we do, and the mathematics actually agrees with this, is when we have empty available orbitals within a, a sublevel, we're going to put one electron in each empty orbital before we double up. So that's what it was saying here. Within sublevels that contain multiple orbitals, like this 2p, one electron is placed in each orbital with parallel spins. So with, when we say with parallel spins, that just means their orientation is in the same direction. And then we pair them up. So typically we show, I put one electron in this pointing in one direction. I put the second electron in the next available box pointed in the same direction. And the next, and then put, if there was a third electron, I would put it in the next available box. And then only then would I start to pair up. Okay. So here's an example for carbon. Okay. Now, going back to that periodic table again, carbon would have six electrons. So we start with the 1s, we f put two electrons in the 1s, we go on to the 2s, put two electrons here, and then I put two electrons in the 2p sublevel, and I end where carbon is here. So its electron configuration is going to be 
1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And this is its orbital diagram. Again, 1s2, 2s2, and I put two electrons in the in the 2p orbitals, but they place separate orbitals within the same sublevel with parallel spins. Okay. Now, as we start to get into larger and larger elements, there's a little bit of a shortcut that you can use for writing electron configurations. It's, it's referred to as an abbreviated electron configuration. Okay. So what you're allowed to do is if you if you want to show an abbreviated configuration rather than the full configuration, you start from the last noble gas that came before that element. So in this case, let's say we're writing the abbreviated electron configuration for lithium, which normally would be 1s2, 2s1. So with an abbreviated configuration, I go back from the first, the noble gas that came right before lithium, in that case is helium, and I put that in brackets. So that, so that just represents the, the electron configuration for helium. And then I just tack on the extra electrons that I've added on to what was the originally electron configuration for helium. So it's an abbreviated electron configuration. Now really it doesn't shorten it in this case, but when you have electrons, electron configurations with 50, 60 electrons, it does make it simpler. Now you only go back to the previous noble gas. And if you're writing the abbreviated electron configuration of a noble gas, you go to the noble gas that came before that one and then tack on the extra electrons in their proper orbitals. Now on a test, um, I'll tell you whether or not I want you to use an abbreviated or a full electron configuration. And the, um, the Chem 101s will also do that. They'll say either use an abbreviated or use a full. Um, if they ask for a full, don't show an abbreviated, particularly if you're doing like a standardized test because you won't get credit for it. So um, don't don't treat it as just a shortcut. When you if you're answering a test question, make sure it says you're allowed. You can use a configuration before you use this. Um, but a lot of times, if you're looking it up in a book and you're looking up the electron configuration, most of the time you'll see the abbreviated configuration being used. Okay. So just going through the second row of the periodic table, um, here's the orbital diagrams for these next elements, the electron configuration, and then the abbreviated electron configuration. So it just takes the electron configuration of the noble gas that came before it, which would be helium, which has a configuration of 1s2, and then just replaces that part with the noble gas in brackets, and then just adds on the rest of it. Okay, questions so far? Okay. Okay, here's just um, as we go through it, rest of the elements. And notice as I go from nitrogen through neon, I'm adding one electron, but I start with unpaired electrons in parallel spins, and then I double up as I go from neon to oxygen to fluorine to neon to neon. I'm sorry, nitrogen from oxygen to fluorine to neon. And is a full electron configuration for each of those elements. And here's the abbreviated where I take 
the normal gas of the element that came before this one and then tack it on. So you can't say, so with neon, I can't say the electron configuration of neon is just neon in brackets. You're not allowed to do that. You have to start with the noble gas that came before it and then add that on. Now, for the element that came after neon, I can use the symbol for neon and then a 3s1 after that. Okay. So that rule, it's kind of a kind of a jump back, but the rule that I said where you when you have add electrons to a sub level, you have to separate them out before you pair them up. That's just that's Hunt that's referred to as Hun's rule. Okay. Just states the lowest energy configuration for an atom with electrons within a set of orbitals is having the maximum number of unpaired electrons. Okay. But just another way of saying when you're adding electrons to a sub level, give them parallel spins in separate orbitals before you pair them up. Okay. So here's an example. Okay. We want to draw the orbital diagram for nitrogen. So if I was to do that, I would first want to look, find nitrogen on the periodic table. And I notice nitrogen is here. So I just look at the orbitals I need. Okay, 1s, 2s, and 2p, because nitrogen ends in that 2p block. So I'm going to draw boxes for the orbitals that I need. So. I have a 1s, this is only one s orbital within each sublevel. There's a 2s, and then for the 2p sublevels, there's three separate p orbitals, so I have three boxes here. Now for nitrogen, I'm just going to put away my seven electrons. So I put two in this first sublevel two more in the second sublevel, and then one, two, three, four. I pair that up. Okay, so I draw in the 1s electrons, the 2s electrons, and then the last sets of orbitals that go go again in that 3p orbital 2p orbital i'm sorry so one two three okay so one two three four five six seven seven electrons i know i'm done you notice the arrows in the p orbitals are all pointing in the same direction because according to the huns rule that's the most stable configuration when there are before you double up Okay, this is just some more examples of higher orbitals as we're going on. And again, we're just following the same orbital filling rules from lowest to highest. Um, you can look at these on your own, just looking at the element, the atomic number, and drawing the electrons in their orbits. Okay, so let me go on. All right. So I've referred to valence electrons before. But we haven't really made ref com combined valence electrons with how they apply in um, electron orbitals and quantum mechanics. So valence electrons are going to refer to the electrons that are occupying the outermost shell or highest end value within an atom. Okay, so the electron that are in that outermost energy level or outermost shell 
we refer to as valence electrons. The electrons that are inside or below that outermost shell, we're going to call core electrons. And in all cases, the core electrons, the inside electrons, are going to represent noble gas electron configurations, which is why when we write an abbreviated electron configuration, we can use a noble gas. And then what we add on to that noble gas is really just the valence electrons. Now, we've referred to that oct the octet rule with electrons, and we said that with hydrogen, you can have two electrons in that outermost shell, which makes sense because it's only an S orbital, and that S orbital can hold two electrons. And then with the second energy level, we can hold eight. Now, that octet rule that we talk about with the maximum outer number of electrons in a shell of being eight is because when we talk about valence electrons, we're referring to par partially filled or fully filled S and P orbitals, which are always on the outside of the atom. And those S and P orbitals can hold at most eight electrons. So that's where our octet rule comes from. It's from the total capacity of those S and P orbitals. So noble, so electron, noble, I'm sorry, valence electrons are always going to refer to those electrons that are in that outermost layer. And they're always going to be either S or P sublevel electrons. So here's sodium, okay, and here's its electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. Now these, we have electrons in these lower energy levels, okay. We have two electrons in this first shell, eight electrons in the second shell, and this electron in the outermost shell is the valence electron. Okay, it's in that third principal energy level. And notice these electrons, our core electrons, have the same electron configuration as a neon. Okay, so these match a noble gas. And so this is why when we show the electron abbreviated con configuration for sodium, we can represent it as neon's configuration with just a 3s1 added on to it. Okay, and here's just other examples of abbreviated configurations. So another handy tool when you're looking at abbre electro abbreviated configurations, you can really see the similarities of elements within a group. Okay, so this is group one. So this is the first column of the periodic table. We have lithium, sodium, potassium. They all have the same number of valence electrons. Okay, they all have a single valence electron. Now, the, the principal number of that electron is bigger as we go down the group, but they're all occupying a single s orbital. Now, same with group two. These are all in the second column. And notice they have the same number of valence electrons. Okay. So this is just another illustration of the periodic table blocks, and I've already talked about this, so let's skip a little by this. So, let's see if we can try this problem. See if you can figure out the electron configuration for chlorine using the periodic table. So, I'll 
go back to that periodic table block, or if you have a periodic table on you, you can pull it out. So let's see if we can figure out the electron configuration from chlorine, which is here. Okay, so we're going to start from the lowest element and just work our way through the table until we get the chlorine. So we start here, go from he hydrogen to helium. So that we would represent that as 1s2. And then what would come after that? 1s2. Two S two. Okay, now we're in the P region, so that would be two P so one S two, two S two. Yeah, we have we three three p five is correct, but we haven't gotten that far yet. We're still at, we're at two p before we can get. We will get there. So it's two p six, right? So one s two, two s two, two p six. Then now we're in the third row. Three s two. Then we can get now if we see here one two three four five three p five. So I'll type it out. So it'd be 1s2, 2s2. Now, no, now the last number should be a superscript, but it'll be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and then we end with 3p5 because we haven't reached the end of it. So that's what the electron configuration would look like. Again, remember the, the last number is a superscript. I just can't put superscripts in this uh, chat box. Okay, so we're just walking through the table, making note of each sublevel group as we pass through it, and just ending at the element that we're at. That. So again, we went through the 1s2 block, the 2s2 block, the 2p6 blocks, 3s blocks, and we went only five across the 3p section, ending on the fifth box in. So 3p5. Now, with the periodic table, then we see this, the 4S level is going to fill before the 3D level because 4S is slightly lower than the 3D sublevel. And again, we see this in 5, where the 5S fills before the 4D, and then in period 6, with 6S fills before 5D, because again, 6S has lower energy than the 5D. These are just more more examples of electron configurations. Now, just skip. Okay. Now, remember I said at the beginning, when we're talking about the Schrodinger equation with and all these atomic number and orbital filling rules, they were originally based upon simple elements, okay, because we don't have the computing power capacity to calculate the electron orbitals for these very dense elements with multiple electrons. It's just the mathematics is 
is uh, would, it would take too long for the even supercomputers to solve. We're taught, these are in co computer science, they call these NP hard problems. Um, it, it's just a problem that would take a computer thousands of years to solve in terms of the amount of work it needs to do. So we base them on simple elements and then we just take those rules and apply them to more complicated elements and then just use observation of uh, electron spectrum to see how well our guesses match. And because of that, we do find there's a few cases where there are exceptions to the electron filling rules. And you usually, you'll see this in transition metals. So here's an example. Typically, half-filled or fully filled D sublevels are more stable than partially filled. So if I take copper, now normally if you're following the strict filling rules, you'd you go through the sublevels and you'd have 4D2 and then 3D9 because copper is in the ninth box across the D sublevel. But what we actually observe is that this is not as stable as the bottom configuration. Okay, so what happens is this 4S electron jumps down and partially fills, or completely fills, the 3D sublevel. Because we said half filled and fully filled D sublevels are actually more stable than these partially filled ones. So in this case, this configuration is actually slightly lower energy and more stable than this configuration. So this is one of those exceptions to the electron filling rules, where you have cases where you might have a D sublevel that's only one electron short of being filled, you'll, sometimes you'll see a 4S or an S electron in valence electron fall down and fill up that lower level sublevel. Um, this actually also explains why certain elements can have multiple ionic charges because they have multiple valences. Okay. Copper can sometimes lose more than have has multiple charges because copper can lose different amounts of electrons and form stable ions. And it's the interaction with these D sub that is why certain transition elements can have multiple charges. Here's another example, okay, chrome, chromium. So it has a 3D4, so it's a almost half-filled D sublevel. And again, this 4S2 is going to fall down and we'll end up with a 4S1 3D5. Okay, it's not what you would normally expect based upon the filling rules. But this is what we observe. Okay, we, we see this pattern a lot when you have half filled or almost half filled, or almost fully filled D sub levels. You often see an S electron jump down to help fill it up. Okay, so. Going back to periodic table. So periodic table is organized by electron configurations and the way the electrons are in their orbits. So we see that elements, because they have similar valence shells, they actually have similar chemical reactivities. Because when elements react, it's the valence electrons that are going to play the most critical role in those chemical reactions. So we're going to see that elements in the same group 
have the same valence electrons, so they're going to ex exhibit similar chemical reactivity. Okay. Let me go on. Okay. Let me get to ions. So we've talked about way back in um, end of chapter two that ions are formed when atoms gain or lose electrons. And so a positive ion, a cation, is going to form when one or more electrons are removed from an atom. And for um, these elements, it's going to always be the highest or last added electrons that are first removed. So normally for main group elements, the electrons that are going to be roots are really the last el electrons that are added. For transition metals and inner transition metals, there's a little bit of a difference. Okay, We start by taking off the highest S electrons. But then when tr ions are formed, we are going to start removing electrons from either the D or F orbitals and those are going to end up being removed. And sometimes a varying amount of electrons can be lost from these D or F orbitals before they're stable. Now, anions are going to be electrons that are added to an atom. And when we're drawing electron configurations for ions, we're still going to just follow the off bar principle when we're adding electrons. Okay, we're going to still follow the same rules. So if I have an ion that has two extra electrons from its normal configuration, I'm just going to add those two electrons in the way I would normally do following the off bar principle. Okay, here's a simple example. Um, take sodium. What is the electron configuration of sodium ion? So this is Na+. Plus. So what I would want to do is look at the original configuration of sodium and then just make an adjustment to that. So I can actually go back and if I look at sodium, Sorry, I just had it. Here we go. Okay. So it's this configuration of neon with this 3s1. So sodium's electron configuration is going to be when it's an ion, it's just going to lose this last electron to form a plus one charge. So then it's just going to have the same electron configuration of neon. Okay, so it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So for the electron configuration of sodium, it's going to look like it's going to actually be the same as the electron configuration of neon. If you're having trouble, listen. Um, you go back to the main page. There's actually there's a number to dial in. You just have to dial the number and punch in the code. And yeah, you know, sometimes you have better luck with the uh, the phone versus the uh, internet. Okay. 
So sodium loses one electron. So if this 3S is going to come off, it's going to have the same electron configuration as neon. Now for phosphorus, this has a 3 minus charge. So I'm going to take this electron configuration and add on three more electrons. So this 3PC, 3P3 becomes a 3P6. And this actually resembles, is also a noble gas configuration. And remember what we said back when ions try to emulate the, elect the electron arrangement or electron configuration of noble gas because noble gases tend to have very stable configurations. Now aluminum, it's going to lose two electrons. So it has one here and here. So when it forms a two plus ion, it's just going to lose the 3P and a 3s2 to become 1s2, 2p6, 3p6, 3s1. Now, normally, aluminum does form, also forms plus three ions. Now, transition metals, again, are a little different. So here, is the orbital for the transition metal iron. Now again, normally we're going to take electrons off the outermost or valence layer. So even though 3D6 was added last, when iron forms a plus two charge, we're actually going to first remove the electrons from its valence shell, which would be the 4S2. So we'll take those off. And so what I'm left with is a 3P6, 3D6. Now, samarium is, okay, this is a real mess. But again, we're just going to, this is going to form a plus 3 ion. We start with this charge, and then we, first remove electrons from its valence shell. So if you look at this electron configuration, which electrons are in it? What's its outermost shell? I should say. What's the biggest number in the electron configuration? It's the 3D, it's at, not the 3D6. That's, that's way on the inside. Outermost is a six, level six. It's a 6S2. So I'm going to first take electrons off of this valence shell. And then, now I have to take three electrons off. So I'm going to add one more off the next highest level. So for transition metals, even though you've added electrons to the innermost level as you build them up, when they form ions, they're always going to first lose electrons from their valence shell. And the valence shell doesn't always necessarily mean the last electrons that you added. It's going to be the electrons that are in the highest principal energy level. So the 6s2, even though they weren't added last, they are on the outside of the atom. Okay, the, this 4f6 are two levels below. Okay, so I'm going to first remove electrons from my valence shell, and only then I, I'm going to remove electrons from the lower energy levels. Now this only this applies for transition metals.
Now, a lot of times when you see electron orbitals written, they won't write them in the orbital that they're filling. They'll actually write them in the orbital going from innermost to outermost electrons. So sometimes you might see it written as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10. Then they write 4s2, 4p6, 4d10, 4f6. And then we start with the fifth shell, 5s2, 5p6, and then 6s2. That's normally the way you'll see it. Um, sometimes it's nothing wrong to, with writing them the way that, that you fill the fill them up. It's just more commonly to show it that way. Okay. So a little bit a little bit of a break from the orbitals and electron configuration. So last thing I want to get into is periodic properties. So what we're going to see is that there's many properties of the atoms that are going to vary at, at periodic functions of the, the element. So three of the common periodic properties is the size of the atom or ion, the ionization energy, which is the how much energy it takes to pop an electron off an atom and the electron affinity and that refers to the ability of an atom to attract an electron whether it's pulling on it for a covalent bond or if it's grabbing on it to form a negative ion so Just in terms of definition, the covalent radius is just defined as one half the distance of two identical atoms when they are joined by a covalent bond. Okay, we have to get a kind of a good definition for radius, and it's a little tricky to talk about the radius of an atom where it really doesn't have a defined edge. Because remember, these are probability regions, so there's really no definite sides outside of an atom it kind of just fades away to nothingness so we want to have a definition of radii so they define it as taking a two atoms of the same element that are bonded in a covalent bond and taking one half the distance between the nuclei and we call that the radius of the atom so using that as our definition what we see that as we go down a group the size of the radius increases, size of the atom increases, which makes sense because we're adding a new layer of electrons as we go down the periodic table from within a column. So the atoms are going to get bigger. Okay, because we're adding electrons that are increasingly further and further away from the nucleus. Okay, so here's so I'm just looking at halogens now. Okay, here's fluorine. That's its radius, 128 picometers. Chlorine, the next element down the column, 198. Bromium is 228, and iodine is 266. So we're seeing this pattern. As you go down a column of the periodic table, the size of the atoms is getting bigger. The atomic radius is increasing. Okay. So another property we're going to look at, and this is actually a, has to do with um, explaining the radius, is this term we call effective nuclear charge. So effective nuclear charge is a the pull exerted on a specific electron by the nucleus. So let's say we have an electron orbiting an atom. Effective nuclear charge is the strength of the pull that the nucleus is exerting on that one electron. Now it's going to be it's going to take into account all the electrons in the lower energy levels. Okay, because 
if you have an atom with multiple layers of electrons, those underlying layers are going to interfere with the pull from the nucleus. They add a little bit of interference. Okay, it's literally, it's like electrical interference. It's like if you, there's a lot, if, there's, if you're trying to listen to a radio and there's like a, a motor going on, a lot of electrical interference, you get a lot of static on the radio and it affects your signal. Well, same thing. If there's a lot of electrons spinning around the nucleus, it interferes with the pull of an outer electron and the nucleus, and as a result, the effective nuclear charge actually decreases. So for hydrogen, we have one electron, and there's no electron, and there's no other electrons get interfering. So the effective nuclear charge is the same as the nuclear charge. Okay, it, there's one proton. There's no interference, so the effective nuclear charge is the same as the nuclear charge. For all other atoms, okay, the electrons are going to be shielded from the pull of the nucleus by the other electrons present, causing interference. So those core electrons shield the outermost electrons from the nuclear pull. So, as we go from the left side of the periodic table to the right, the core electrons don't change because we're not really adding electrons to those inner layers most of the time. But the nuclear charge increases by one each time. So the shielding isn't really affected because the core electrons don't change, but the nuclear charge increases greatly. So as we move across the period, you're actually going to see the size of the atoms get smaller, okay, because the nuclear charge is getting bigger as you go from the left to the right across the table. But the shielding isn't really affected at all. So the stronger pull is pulling those outermost electrons, drawing them closer to the nucleus. So here's a little diagram. Okay, we see what we were talking about before. As you go from top to bottom, the size of the atoms gets bigger. As you go across, you start to see a trend where the atoms get tend to get smaller as you go from left to right. It's really apparent here. Okay, because as we go across, the nuclear charge is getting bigger, but the shielding isn't really being affected. So the outermost electrons are being pulled closer and closer and closer to the nucleus, causing the size of the atoms to get smaller. So as a result, there's a general trend that as you go from top to bottom, the size of the atoms get bigger, and as you go from left to right, the size of the atoms get smaller. Now, it's not perfect. Okay, You'll see cases where... Sometimes the electrons get a little bigger, and that has to do with some of those weird, funky rules we talk about when the dealing with the, uh, the DNF orbitals. But as a general trend, you'll see size of the atoms get smaller from left to right. Okay, here's a little more, more of a visual diagram. Okay, so. Here's helium. Now I go to the next element. There's a big jump in size because I just added a new layer of electrons. So lithium is much bigger than helium because I added a new layer. But then as I go across the table from lithium to its the noble gas that comes across it, there's this trend that the size gets smaller. 
And then when I start a new row, the radius jumps up again. And then as I go across the table, the size gets smaller. So you see this trend. As you go down a group, the size gets bigger. Okay, if I look at this group, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, we do see a trend as I go down a single column, the size of the elements get bigger. But as I go across a row, the size of the elements decreases as a general trend. Now, we also, we also see this happening with ions. So when I make a positive ion, I'm going to decrease the amount of electrical interference because there's one less electron. So all those remaining electrons now are going to get pulled closer to the nucleus. So a positive ion or cation has fewer electrons, but the same number of protons as a parent atom. So as a result, when I remove electrons from the outer valence shell, there's a greater effective nuclear charge because there's less interference from the other electrons, and the electrons are pulled closer to the nucleus. So what happens in that case is a cation is always going to be smaller than the original atom that was derived from. Now, the opposite happens from anions. Okay, when I add electrons to the nucleus, I'm sorry, when I add electrons to the atom, there's more interference because the electrons are positive or negatively charged. They tend to repel each other. So that greater repulsion causes the size of the atom to get bigger. So as a result, anions, negative ions, are always going to be larger because when I add the electrons, I increase the repulsion and the atom size gets the atomic size gets bigger. Okay, so here's an example aluminum and its radius. The aluminum three, I have three fewer electrons on the outside, but the same number of protons in the nucleus, so that it's a stronger relative pull because there's less electrical interference from those electrons they get pulled in closer to the nucleus because the, the nucleus has, full elect, has fewer electrons to ho hold in. With an anion, when I add electrons, those electrons start to repel each other even more, and that pushes out the size of the atom. And as a result, anions tend to be bigger than the atom derived from. Okay, one more. Ionization energy. Now, ionization energy is the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from an atom, whether when you're forming a positive ion. So, first ionization energy you might see is the energy it takes to remove the first electron, second ionization is the second electron. So if you're starting with a neutral atom, do you think the first electron or the second electron is going to be harder to remove? correct the second, okay? Because when you're starting, you have a neutral atom of, with zero charge. So you're taking, you're pulling an electron off something that has zero charge, okay? So that's the first ionization energy. Now, for the second electron, now you have an ion with a positive charge. So that second electron is going to be harder to remove because you're removing a negative charge from something that's already positive. And so the second ionization energy is going to be bigger 
in the first ionization energy. And as and if there's a third or fourth, it continually gets higher and higher. So what we're going to see that ionization energy is inverse to atomic radius. So the so if I look at the as, as the atomic radius gets bigger, you'll see the ionization energy gets smaller because as the electrons get further away from the nucleus, they're easier to remove. So so what you'll see is that ionization energy is inversely related to atomic size. So as atomic radius increases, ionization energy increases. So as a result, when you go down a group, you're going to see ionization energy gets smaller and smaller. And as you go across a period, ionization energy is going to get bigger. So this is why on the periodic table, the first elements in a row lose their electrons very easily because it's low ionization energy, it's easy to take them off. But as you go across the table, it gets harder and harder to remove those electrons. Okay, and that's why at the end of the table, they don't want to form positive charges. They, it's very difficult to remove an electron off a halogen or a noble gas. Okay, they have more likely, they, they want to grab more electrons. They don't want to lose them. So here is a trend of ionization energy, and it's actually the opposite of what we saw for radius, okay, as ionization energy is getting smaller as we're going down a period, and that's, we said the radius was getting bigger, and as we go across a row, ionization energy is increasing. So this is the start of the row, this is the end of the row. So going from lithium to neon, ionization energy increases. We're going from sodium to argon, ionization energy increases. So we send, again, we see this trend as we go across, ionization energy starts low and increases. And this is just showing you the numerical values and it basically shows the same data. Okay, ionization energy as we go across and down a table. Uh, Skip that. Uh, okay, last thing. Okay, electron affinity is measures the ability of an atom to attract an ion, attract an electron to it. Okay, so it's you can almost think of it as the opposite of ionization energy. Okay. Stronger the electron affinity, the more likely it is to attract an electron. So we it's actually defined as the energy change for the process of adding an electron to a gaseous atom to form an anion. Okay, so when if I have a gaseous atom and I want to make it a negative ion, the, the electron affinity measures the energy change in that process. Okay, so elements that are more likely to form negative ions tend to have a negative electron affinity. So, we see that as we go across the table, electron affinities become more negative, which means electrons are more likely to attract, I'm sorry, atoms are more likely to attract electrons to them as you go across the table. This, this is why we see at the end of the table, we find atoms that tend to form negative ions versus positive ions.
Okay. I won't go through all these deviations, but the la the, the only exception to the rule is the noble gases. Okay. I said electron affinity tends to get more negative as you go across the table because the electrons are more likely to attract electrons, with the exception of the noble gases. Because the noble gases have a completely filled shell and they have full S and P orbitals, they're not going to attract any more electrons in that shell because their they're, electrons are filled. So if they were to add another electron, it would have to be added to the ne next higher energy, principal energy level. So with noble gases, you're going to find that they tend to have very small, low attractions for electrons. Okay, so here's just showing the electron affinity. So we see this trend as we go across, we tend to get more negative, meaning they're more likely to attract electrons to the, until we get to the noble gas, and then we have it has that exception to the rule. Okay, I think that was uh, anything else I'm going to cover tonight. No. Okay. Now I'm going to get into uh, bonding types next week, so we'll skip that tonight. So um, I posted the this week's homework online. So it's mostly covering just rules for writing electron configurations, some of the concepts we talked about with the different types of quantum numbers and their orbitals. and Everyone. Okay, I thought I lost you guys for a second. So I think it's pretty straightforward. I will, I'm going to go through the homework from this past week and I'll just type up some of the solutions to the equation so you have access to them because I, I noticed that the Chem 101 is, gives you the answer but it doesn't actually take you through the how to solve the problem, some of those problems. So I want to make sure I, you have access to that. So next week will be the last week of new material. So I'm mainly going to focus on cleaning up Chapter 6 and then Chapter 7 with, we're going to get into electron geometry, different types of covalent bonds, and electron shapes. I mean, I'm sorry, um, molecular shapes. So I would finish up Chapter 6. In Chapter 7, paying particular attention to molecular geometry and Vesper rule for next week. Um, if you haven't checked, haven't looked already, I've graded all the exams, so they should all be posted. Um, so overall, I was very happy with how the grades turned out. To look, I think everyone did a very good job. Um, any questions for tonight? Either on the material or what's coming up. Okay, in that case, hope everyone has a good week. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm I'm been working from home, so I'll have my computer on and I have access to my email. Um, again, if you want to set up like a tutoring session, I can, I'm usually free either in the evening so we can meet in the uh, other, the virtual classroom. So um, ha have a good night, and we'll talk again either later this week or next week.